thanks everyone for for tuning in. Good evening um, for everyone on the call. Hopefully, we'll get a few more people coming. Um, today we are in Cleveland. Um, it's the first journal club we had last year was in Cleveland, so it's been a, a fantastic opportunity to be back. And it's it's been a year of of um, journal clubs behind our back. Um, I was really hoping Dr. Steele could arrange for us to use the university building sort of akin to the presidential debates um, that, that uh, were in Cleveland last year, but perhaps uh, perhaps maybe when, when COVID is behind us, we can host a um, journal club like, like the debate. Um, next slide, please. So this is our team. Uh, we're very well led, of course, by Dr. Galantiak, who supports this um, uh, adventure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just our disclaimer. Um, next slide, please. So fun fact about Cleveland uh, is that it has the world headquarters of duct tape, which I think is um, very useful for the world. It keeps the world together. Uh, but in all seriousness, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Valente to uh, to say a few words about the city and, and, the, um, and the institution. Uh, Dr. Valente, um, he plays a, a very helpful role in the journal club. He's helped me um, liaise with a number of different uh, sites. Um, and of course, he is the director of training at, um, at Cleveland, and he's a fantastic clinician in person. And having seen a number of supervisors on two continents um, during my training, I think he does a fantastic job and he really um, has the trainees back, which was wonderful. Uh, to have the confidence um, when he had my back. Okay, um, please. Thanks, Vlad. Appreciate that. You guys can hear me okay, I suppose. Yeah. So, yeah, Vlad was a fantastic fellow and, uh, and a fantastic colleague as well uh, when he spent his time in Cleveland. And you're always welcome back here, Vlad. You see Cleveland here, my home. I grew up there. I was born and raised. Uh, there's a nice view of the Cuyahoga River there on the left going in through the uh, downtown city and on the right I just wanted to highlight a few things most people many people do know of course the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame but one of the best art museums in the world one of the best orchestras in the world and soon to be one of the best football teams in the world this uh, this fall as well the Cleveland Browns and you can see the middle there there's a, a an art deco type statue of a bridge figure those are the guardians of traffic the Cleveland Indians have now changed their name to the Cleveland Guardians and that's one of the 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 nidises of the name was that's those those monuments right there. Uh, next slide on uh, Cleveland, please. And then the Cleveland Clinic, uh, much as the city of Cleveland of any other institution, uh, the Cleveland Clinic. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year, uh, 1921. It started off with that corner building there on Euclid Avenue, still there today. Uh, founded by four gentlemen uh, during World War One. To, to forge a better way to take care of patients as a complete unit. And, and carrying on in that tradition, the colorectal unit, one of the first units of colorectal surgery in the world, um, started by one of our, one of our founders, uh, Rupert Turnbull, and then through uh, Victor Fazio, now with Dr. Scott Steele taking over the helm as well. So uh, we have a big history there, been training fellows since the late 1960s, over 220 plus fellows have been trained there. And that's as Dr. Steele said, you know, the, the, the feather in our cap or the lifeblood of our, our department is the fellowship, and we're very proud of it. And uh, looking forward to the new class starting here. We got a couple of fellows starting today, or starting with the uh, journal club today. Uh, and then we got a new new class interviewing in the next few weeks for next year already. So looking forward to that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So today we're going to have uh, my partners, uh, Dr. David Liska, one of the discussants on the uh, on the hot versus cold snare polypectomy, Dr. Liska um, is the director of our Weiss Center, our hereditary colorectal center, also our young onset colorectal center, and he holds a, a distinguished chair of Dr. James Church, and he's a fantastic surgeon and researcher. And then we have one of our newest partners, Dr. Anaran Obama, who uh, came to us, uh, who did training with us a few years back. Uh, she's just started back up with, with us again. She is a master at the robots, reoperative surgery. She trained, uh, she trained here with us uh, as well for a year under Dr. Steele's tutelage, so she's welcome to have her back as well. And we have Dr. Uh, Carla Justiniano, a new fellow starting from the University of Rochester. 
She'll be discussing the hot versus cold snare paper. And uh, we have Sammy Judiba. Dr. Judiba has been a Cleveland Clinic resident, uh, and now he's doing our fellowship year with us as well. And uh, I, I know Vlad will get into, but Dr. Emery Gorgon, uh, one of my partners, him, Dr. Gorgon, and I started off in the same year. Dr. Gorgon is the head of our uh, colorectal surgical oncology section. He's also director of the uh, endoluminal surgery center here at the Cleveland Clinic. He's doing amazing things uh, with saving the colon and taking out lesions in a non-traditional surgical way. So that's our team for today. Thanks for that. Um, next slide. So we're going to move the poll a little bit down the list today, uh, just because the integral member of the poll um, Stephen Brenstetter, I think, is still operating. So, um, uh, but, but we'll get back to this question. So, next slide, please. Um, so, our first first paper uh, is the impact of chrome endoscopy on um, adenoma misrate during colonoscopy, which is a systematic review. Um, uh, kindly, it, it will be presented by Sammy Judiba, and then the. Um, the um, expert commentary will be by Dr. Barmer. Um, uh, Sammy, uh, nice to see you after a few years and, and um, uh, please um, uh, tell us about the paper. Yep. Uh, nice to see you, Vlad, as well. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a kind of long article, but in the next slide, we're gonna summarize this. Uh, so this uh, study performed a, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis to examine adenoma mess rate when using uh, white uh, light endoscopy compared to uh, electronic uh, chromo or virtual uh, chroma endoscopy modalities like, uh, as you know, narrow band uh, uh, imaging, blue light uh, imaging and linked colors and eye scan and so on. So next slide. So, you know, despite, you know, colorectal being the uh, third most common cancer, um, and despite colonoscopy being the most uh, accurate examination to detect uh, colorectal neoplasia, it has been shown uh, to miss polyps in one in five uh, cases uh, with uh, an even a higher numbers when it comes to smaller polyps. So endoscopists could use uh, the standard chromoendoscopy technique uh, to that dye the, uh, and coat the mucosa of the colon and better visualization of the flat polyps or uh, non-polypoid lesions. Uh, it's effective, but unfortunately it's uh, time consuming and cumbersome. So most of the people uh, kind of trying to avoid it if they could. So here is, it goes this novel technique, which is the electronic uh, coma endoscopy. Whether it work, uh, we're gonna discuss it again in this study. Um, so um, adenoma miss rate is, um, even cited as a quality, but it's not discussed thoroughly in the uh, clinical trials uh, as a primary goal. Uh, next slide. Can we go to the next slide? Oh, huh? So, uh, okay, so again, um, in this uh, uh, study, the, the, the relevant study uh, were accumulated from the uh, common search here, like uh, Midline and uh, Cochrane database review. And these articles in tandem randomized clinical trial, and these, uh, trials are comparing the um, virtual endoscopy compared to the standard uh, white light uh, endoscopy. Um, this review excludes study that did not compare uh, electronic uh, chroma endoscopy to the white light uh, endoscopy in a tandem trials. And uh, the study also did not uh, uh, report the missed rate well excluded from this. And then uh, by the end, uh, a correlation between the adenoma miss rate and adenoma reduction rate was performed using both electronic uh, chroma endoscopy technique and the white light uh, endoscopy. Next slide. So out of uh, 
total of uh, 593 uh, study um, with exclusion criteria, it's down to seven uh, tandem uh, randomized clinical trial for analysis in this uh, article. Uh, all studies were prospective and randomized, um, three from South Korea, two from Japan, and one from China and one from United States. Um, adenoma miss, uh, miss rate was uh, either the primary or the secondary outcome of each study. In the majority of the study, the endoscopy was performed by an experienced endoscopist, uh, either higher, re reported either as higher or advanced. Um, of a total, uh, in these seven study of a total of 3,507 uh, colonoscopies, uh, 200, uh, 2,272 adenoma were detected and 508 were missed. Um, when comparing uh, adenoma miss rate of uh, electronic um, uh, chromo, end, uh, chromo endoscopy uh, in the right-hand uh, uh, table, um, uh, there is no difference uh, in either technique using either electronic uh, chromo endoscopy or white light uh, endoscopy, as the miss rate is reported as 17.9% and 21% uh, for the white light endoscopy. But our ratio is not significant um, in this. But when this divided as um, uh, uh, as, a t as, as each technique of uh, the electronic uh, chromo endoscopy as a subgroup, for example, for the narrow band imaging subgroup, um, the adenoma miss rate was 22% and compare it with white light endoscopy, it's 26%. But again, unfortunately for making it only as a subgroup, the odd ratio was not significant. But when you pull uh, analysis uh, and make it as a, a result of the narrow band endoscopy and the blue light uh, imaging and the linked uh, color imaging. Um, there's a miss rate with those technique about 16.7% and with the white light endoscopy is 22.9% from those pool studies. And this odd ratio was significant. Um, and for secondary outcome, which not included in this slide, but I will just go through it quickly. Uh, when it compared the small uh, or diminutive uh, adenoma less than 10 uh, millimeter, uh, again, uh, based on the review, the, uh, the adenoma miss rate was not significant between each technique, either electronic uh, chromo endoscopy or the white light endoscopy. Uh, again, uh, comparing it to um, adenoma detection rate, not missed rate, uh, it was not, uh, there is no significant difference. And when, the, when uh, a correlation was performed between adenoma detection rate and uh, adenoma missed rate, there's also unfortunately no um, clinical significant or no association was found. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, uh, unfortunately, the current analysis of the tandem randomized clinical trials, which were prospective, not support the fact that electronic um, chrome endoscopy improved neither um, adenoma detection rate uh, nor uh, adenoma uh, miss rate. There, therefore, uh, still can limit the use of electronic uh, chromo endoscopy maybe to better visualization and characterization of the adenoma than it, achieving a higher rate of detection rate or missed rate. Uh, and this is, should be also considered um, when uh, trying to add the cost and the benefit of upgrading your system to more uh, electronic uh, chroma endoscopy. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, can, can I possibly get um, Dr. Barma to uh, highlight some of the pearls of her wisdom from this study? Um, so I am a big fan of new technology that makes me better at my job, obviously. Um, so any way that I can do better at colonoscopies and improve my adenoma detection rate would make me very happy. Um, 
So unfortunately, you know, this article does point out that there were no differences. It did point out that the pooled analysis showed that there was a significant difference, but unfortunately, I didn't find that clinically applicable because you're not going to use four different types of imaging unless it's all incorporated into one scope. And unfortunately, these different scopes are all separate. Um, you need a separate scope to incorporate all of them. So unfortunately, that significant um, key value that they found that one pooled analysis isn't clinically significant. Now, the article kind of had a little bit of a negative um, tone to it saying, oh, we didn't find a way to improve adenoma detection rate. But when you look at the tables a little closer, one of the things that I thought was encouraging was that the adenoma detection rate was over 25%, no matter how you do it. And so the way I thought about it is when you think about you know, population health and medicine and screening and trying to get out into the community and increase screening, I was very encouraged by this article because it means in order to have an adequate adenoma detection rate, you don't need a fancy scope. You, you need, you know, high definition white light endoscopy, and that's going to get you a high quality adenoma detection rate. They did only use um, endoscopists with a lot of experience, and I think it would be helpful to see how novice endoscopists, they had people who did thousands of scopes, but people who were more novice in their endoscopy, I think it would be interesting to see if these different technologies help them. Um, and so that was kind of my takeaway from this article. Um, the other thing that I was also interested in um, that they didn't talk about was what was their incidence of detecting colorectal cancer? I presume it was the same across all um, modalities but then also high-risk polyps, the ones that were really concerned may in the future turn into um, a cancer if you missed it. So those were kind of my highlights from, from this article. Thanks for that. Particularly the differential with polyps, I think is quite interesting, high-risk versus not. Um, now, I'm going to ask a few questions and I'll direct them at Dr. Valente and he can distribute them amongst who he thinks is the best person to answer. Um, and obviously, if, if anyone has comments, uh, please share them in the chat. The first thing I wanted to ask about um, from the panel is background light. Um, now, when I sit on the, at a computer, I like the room to be bright. When I'm watching a, a movie, an action movie, I like the room to be dark. Um, th what does the panel do in terms of having the light in the room and does that differ um, in polyp detection rate or quality of visualization? Yeah, thanks, Vlad. I'll, I'll start off. I know personally I, I do have the lights way down in the room and there may be one light on or an extra old x-ray box on in the corner of the room or something, but I know there was, a, I'll, I'll point to Scott, Dr. Steele here, I know there was a recent maybe a recent publication on some on some light effects, maybe out of our, our gastroenterology group, but I, I knew it was recently something with the effects of the white light in the room affecting adenoma detection rate. Do you know, Scott? Yeah, there's been a couple of different things that are out there. Some of them, most of the white light is comparing that with chromoendoscopy, and I think that we've all been able to see those ones. And the interesting thing about that is that it has shown um, the, the results are a little bit all over the map with a lot of them showing that white light does just as good at talking about high definition versus not. And so I don't think there's actually as much of kind of sorted out uh, as other. In terms of Vlad's question, nice hair, by the way, Vlad. Uh, I would tell you that the, uh, that yeah, I, I don't actually know of anything in terms of, uh, of lights in the room. I'm only aware of that white light versus high definition TV as well as white light versus chromoendoscopy. Um, the reason I started thinking about it, there's, a, there's one place where I scope where they have background neon lights, um, which kind of, I thought maybe because of lockdown and not getting haircuts, they prevented us from, you know, intravenous injections. Um, certainly, I know that neon lights helps for that, but, um, but, but it is quite gentle on the eyes. And, and I wonder if there is some sort of, um, particularly if you do say 10 or 12 scopes in a row where, where the, the room does start affecting uh, your pickup rate. Now, any other institutions? Uh, I, I would, we've got Dr. Fleshman here, who's actually the, um, the, the guest for our next journal club. Thank you for that for next, um, next month. But perhaps is there anything that they do in Texas that they don't do in Ohio? When you get to be my age, if you turn down the lights in the endoscopy suite, I'm usually snoring in the corner. So, 
you have to be careful with that aspect as well. Uh, Dr. Lichlider actually stays awake most of the time when he's scoping. And uh, I think it does make a difference. When you're doing laparoscopy, if you don't use dimmed lights in the operating room, you can't see as well. So I think there's something to be said for that. But my experience in the endoscopy suite is only under propofol. Thanks. Um, another question I have is, again, in terms of the attention, um, how, many, how many scopes do we do until the, um, our attention starts sort of drifting a bit? And is it more efficient to have, say, two half-day lists compared to one full-day list in terms of the adenoma detection rate, say? It's not covered in the study. In fact, I haven't really seen a lot of, about that in the literature. Just wondering what, what people think. Um, it's Mike Vlad. So actually, we looked at that just recently. It should be hopefully getting published in the American Journal of Surgery. But looking at AM and PM and no detection rates. Now, we didn't look at if the surgeon was doing them all day versus just afternoon or, one, or the evening. So that was one of the big limitations. But but in general, AM versus PM, we did not show a decrease in adenoma detection rates or any other quality metrics in that particular study. But I know there has been multiple things written upon surgeon or endoscopist fatigue as the day goes on. Um, so um, I know there has been some papers out there. I don't know if anyone, Dr. Gorgon or Dr. Steele wants to, or Dr. Obama wants, or Liska wants to add on to that. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, I think you said it well. I think there is uh, good data out there that shows about the AM, PM type thing. And so... Um, I, it's just human nature as that goes. One thing I would co comment here is uh, Dr. Valente as well as Volet, uh, you know, very nice, interesting paper. Uh, obviously, the, the, the paper here is looking at something that maybe it's hard to catch, I don't know, detection rate. I'm not sure if that's the right objective or outcome to measure with uh, narrow band imaging or white light in, uh, endoscopy uh, uh, because uh, I mean, it, routine use is very difficult, you know, it's time consuming, but there, uh, I don't think we should get the wrong message here. Uh, I, there is a role probably for uh, uh, chromoendoscopy as well as narrowband imaging in select patients, especially uh, we recently published with Dr. Leitner, our experience on, for example, uh, patients with uh, sporadic adenomas and IBD. So there, you know, the, these, uh, in this group of uh, subgroup of patients, for example, narrowband imaging might be very useful where you really struggle in an inflamed mucosa where you can recognize the, the lesions a little bit better. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to increase your adenoma detection rate across the board, probably these are not very uh, efficient because time consuming spraying uh, or switching back and forth between white light endoscopy and chroma endoscopy. So that would be uh, difficult to accomplish. Having said that, if you're going to concentrate on adenoma detection rate, I think the AI or uh, artificial intelligence is something we should start thinking and talking about. That's probably there's more, uh, you know, uh, process learning of the, uh, of the devices and computers and mechanisms uh, 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 or machine learning that that uh, gonna help us uh, in the in the in the coming years for to increase the adenoma detection rate. One last comment I would like to do make is that about the neuroband imaging. Also, when you look at the studies, when you look at the group of studies here, they are mostly after 2010 and all that, like mentioned earlier, used high definition scope. So really the uh, uh, the the value of these narrowband imaging or chroma endoscopy was when stand, standard light endoscopy was used. But now things move to uh, high definition. So really you can recognize and see uh, very high quality me uh, measure the, 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 all the, the differences in the mucosa. So it's, it's, it's less so important, I think, in this D and H, the chroma endoscopy, except that subgroup that I mentioned earlier. Uh, just to kind of, further this point with a question. Do you think different segments of the colon should have different techniques to uh, enhance um, um, adenoma detection rate? For instance, in the right colon where arguably there's more flat polyps, uh, perhaps the chromoendoscopy might be more useful. Whereas in the sigmoid where there's muscular hypertrophy, you know, some people describe a lot of success with underwater endoscopy. Um, do, do you differentiate 
sort of call that into segments or or just differentiate patients into risk of you know adenoma um, detection sort of missed or something like that that's a good point if you're asking me you know I, I obviously on the right side it's maybe a little bit easier to see because your exposure and environment is a little bit larger broader surface versus for example on the sigmoid and left side you know you your diameter of the tube is a little bit smaller not necessarily the light but there are other resources for those purposes for example caps or like umbrella type of uh, devices that attaches at the end of the scope which you know when you pull withdraw uh, the scope you, you know it spreads out the the views or 180 degrees view like three screen uh, scopes are available for the, those purposes especially on the left side so you can make a narrow space larger or even some argue and recommend using cap which we use for advanced endoscopy, you know, ESDs, the cap, for example, can spread the faults a little bit further to increase adenoma detection rate. So there's a lot of literature on how to increase AD, ADR in different ways, not necessarily on the right and left. I'm aware of any light, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual, virtual coma endoscopy is beneficial. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Great points, um, um, I think. Uh, if um, th there's uh, there's a comment from the um, from the chat from a fellow Australian about adenoma detection rate, I think we've covered that. Um, perhaps we would then continue on to the next paper, um, please. Um, the next paper is called Histological Comparison of Cold versus Hot Snare Resection uh, of the Colonic Mucosa. Um, it'll be presented kindly by Dr. Carla Justiniano and then critiqued by Dr. David Liska. So in this study, uh, Taki and I uh, present the histological comparison of cold versus hot snare resection of the colorectal mucosa. Uh, next slide. So can you speak up a little bit more, please? Can you hear me now? All right. Um, so we know that colonoscopic resection of adenomatous polyps uh, reduces colorectal cancer incidence and mortality, and this is widely accepted as a standard procedure to er eradicate these premalignant lesions, uh, but the best method of actual removal is still uh, not standardized and it's somewhat debatable. So although hot polypectomy has the added effect of tissue ablation to promote uh, complete resection and hemostasis, some studies have shown that an increased uh, risk of post-procedure complications can be seen, uh, such as delayed bleeding and perforation uh, as compared to cold biopsies. Um, so it's been suggested that the delayed bleeding after hot polypectomy um, can be due to cauterization-related thermal injury um, of the submucosal vessels. Um, for example, in a porcine model, hot resection caused submucosal necrosis and inflammation of deeper layers, including the muscularis propria. Um, and this may then increase the risk of vessel damage and subsequent bleeding. Uh, but the actual histologic submucosal architecture after hot versus cold uh, snare resection had not been previously studied uh, in humans. And so the authors aim to clarify the mechanisms underlying why delayed bleeding occurs less commonly with cold resection than after hot. Uh, next slide. Um, so the study cohort comes from Japan, where 15 patients with colorectal cancer underwent hot and cold biopsies the day prior to colorectal cancer resection. Uh, the biopsies were obtained near the malignant lesion as to be included in the specimen, and both biopsies were done with the same 13 millimeter snare, uh, leading to approximately a one centimeter squared mucosal defect. Uh, patients were excluded if they were an ASA of three or higher, had bleeding disorders, or were on antithrombotic therapy. Uh, to study the biopsy sites, the submucosa was divided into half, marking a shallow and a deep uh, submucosa layer. And the primary outcome was the depth of mechanical destruction. Secondary outcomes included the width of destruction, depth of remaining mucosa, number of vessels remaining at the resection sites, and the number and diameter of vessels in the undamaged uh, submucosa. Next slide. So the primary outcome was death of mechanical destruction, and the authors found that 100% of cold snare resections were uh, limited to the shallow submucosa, 
where 60% of hot snare resections reach the deep submucosa and 20% advance further into the muscularis propria. Uh, furthermore, uh, thermal denaturation seen on specific stains uh, rather than the mechanical destruction itself actually reach the muscularis propria in every single hot snare resection site. Um, there is no significance in the width of destruction between cold and hot resections. Uh, the median number of remaining large vessels was three after hot snare resections and five after cold snare. And the shallow layer had significantly more vessels, which were a smaller diameter than the deep layer where the larger vessels were found. Next slide. So altogether, the authors concluded that hot snare resection causes deeper damage than cold snare resection as it often reached muscularis propria as a mechanical defect and it always reached it as, a ther as thermal damage. Um, they noted that on the horizontal plane, the mucosal damage was of similar width and thus the snare does constrict the damage and does not extend outward. And finally, they concluded that the deep submucosal layer contains more large blood vessels, which undergo increased damage with hot snare polypectomy, and this may lead to delayed bleeding. In contrast, cold snare resection only reaches the shallow submucosa with no thermal damage at all, and may be less likely to damage large vessels and less likely to cause delayed bleeding. Uh, note that delayed bleeding itself could not be assessed in this patient cohort since surgery and therefore removal of the specimen uh, occurred on post polypectomy day one. Uh, the authors finished their discussion by asking what is the optimal technique for polypectomy and should we and can we use cold snare technique uh, for even more settings than we usually do? For example, can, should we be using it for larger polyps? Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, that's a great summary. Um, Dr. Lisko, would you mind uh, saying a few words? Sure, yeah. So I, I really enjoy this paper. I think from just thinking about the idea that the researchers had here, right, this is a question that um, I was always wondering about, right? All the gas controllers, they always tell us that cold snares are better, that you have less delayed bleeding than hot snares. And, but us as surgeons, we're very comfortable with cautery, right? We do it every day and, and you know, hopefully not all of us have delayed bleeding after we cauterize vessels in the OR. So it was always something I was wondering about, why do, why do cold snares versus hot snares cause less bleeding? And uh, the paper here, um, you know, they, they had that same question and they said, let's answer it by looking at the specimen. And, you know, it's not a very difficult study to do. They took 15 patients that, you know, they're going to have surgery anyway. They took them the day before and did um, hot and cold snares in the same patient in the same segment. So really sort of elegant um, study and, and a nice way of looking at this and answering it by showing that when you use a hot snare, the damage is deeper. And when you look at it histologically, there's bigger vessels in the deeper layers of the mucosa. And as you get to the muscularis and those bigger vessels, when you, you know, treat them with cautery and damage them with cautery, they are probably the ones that are bleeding in a delayed fashion. So I, I found that very nice. From a study design, it obviously would have been better since these are, these are delayed bleeds if they wouldn't have done it the day before surgery, if they would have done it three, four or five days or whatever, you want to define as delayed. Um, however, then you get into the difficulty of the patient having to do two separate bowel preps, right? So, so again, when you think about how to design a study, I found it very interesting to, to, to read the study. And again, I, I really enjoyed having a reason now understanding why hot snares um, are potentially more damaging than, than cold snares uh, in, in terms of delayed bleeding. The, the flip side to that was always, you know, we still had, you know, we had some surgeons in our department also who preferred using hot snares first rather than cold snares, even though they acknowledged that there might be a higher risk for bleeding because of the fear that potentially with a cold snare, if you leave some adenomatous tissue behind, the hot snare would destroy it and maybe lead to less recurrence. And that's a question that hasn't obviously wasn't completely addressed or at all almost addressed by this paper. Although I wonder if when they say that they looked at their horizontal plane and they show that the damage was equal in their horizontal plane, maybe that's why um, the cold snare doesn't have any higher recurrence. And you know, the paper gets maybe a little bit carried away towards the end where they say that this paper has profound clinical implications. And um, I don't think there's really any clinical implications from this paper, right? It's a very nice 
study looking at the why, but the question about what snares should we use is answered by larger trials, randomized control trials, which there are, and there have been randomized control trials, comparing cold versus hot snares, showing yes, cold snares have less delayed bleeding, and no, cold snares don't have higher uh, sort of residual adenoma tissue than hot snares. So there have been well-designed studies that have looked at that. And again, it's, it's important to know that we're looking at small polyps here, and those are not large polyps where you have to do an EMR or an ESD. That, that's obviously a whole different type of situation. Um, but for small polyps, they have looked at that in, in large prospective studies showing that the bleeding rate uh, is less, the late bleeding rate, rate is less with cold snares and there's no more residual adenoma tissues. So that's where we get our clinical guidance from us, from large trials. This is not a paper that has any clinical implications, but it's a really interesting paper in terms of explaining the why. So that's, that's I, I enjoy that part of it. That, thanks very much. So I'm going to launch uh, the poll um, and I'll be great, grateful if everyone can try to answer that. Um, and whilst we're doing that, I'm going to start off the discussion uh, questions by asking, what does the panel do in terms of cold versus hot snares? And if there are specific factors that influence the decision, um, you know, size of polyp, saline lift, are you more confident that if you lift the polyp, you can diathermy it, um, anatomical location? Um, Dr. Valente, maybe you can distribute that. Yeah. Too. Thanks, Vi. I know. I know. In terms of hot versus cold, just off the bat, when I was I was trained by surgeons doing colonoscopy, we were uh, almost all of them were hot snares. And for the first part of my training, and then into my first several years of my career, I did a lot of colonoscopies, and I ex very exclusively almost used hot snares, except for the right side. I tend to use cold snares in the cecum. Um, but now, over the years, I've gone way towards cold. Um, I, I think you know, when you look at what some of the things Dr. Gorgon does with like some of the ESDs and EMRs even, some of those nice, some of those bipolar little cautery devices are quite nice and don't do a lot of damage or almost kind of like a um, um, uh, an ablation, uh, I can't think of the word right now, but you know, argon essentially, something very sh superficial. That, that's some of those bleeders, but otherwise a lot of people just put clips on, I know too, if they have a worry. So I'll maybe go with Dr. Bama. She does a lot of colonoscopies as well and, and see what the rest of the team says after that. Um, I really like using cold snares. Um, I find both right side and left side, they work pretty well. Um, I haven't had any major issues with bleeding afterwards, for, knock on wood, fortunately. Um, so I kind of stick to the cold snare, just like you said. Dr. Fakir, are you doing colonoscopies uh, routinely with cold snares in your practice? I do not do colonoscopy. I'm a lazy bum. So <laughs> my, my apologies. No. Nope. Um, I um, remember Dr. Gorgon told me once that the difference between cold and hot snares is not just plugging in the device that there's actually um, the um, lasso itself is uh, the cold snare one is a lot sharper. So it gives a clean cut as opposed to a tear. I noticed in this paper, however, that they use the same snare for cold and hot. Um, is this, uh, does that make a difference? Um, yeah, I think that's a good point, Vlad, that you brought it up and I don't recall saying that to you, but apparently I, uh, I did. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a value to that. I always think about cold snares as, uh, as uh, 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 cheese cutters, you know, like wire cheese cutters, you know, the, the, the thinner the wire is, the better it cuts. And like, that's like guillotine, you know, like in the, in the all times. Uh, obviously, it's not a good example, but uh, it, you know, if if the wire is really thick, then it doesn't cut, and that's when you get into problems. I think if if you don't know the mechanism, then uh, that's when people have problems. Then you can close it, but it's gonna just uh, squeeze it, and it's 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 not gonna uh, cut across the tissue. It needs to be really uh, thin wire so it can cut, cut across. So that's the, the, the difference. And that therefore the cold cutting snares are way thinner wires than the uh, large ones. So I'm surprised that they use the same one. 
uh, as a matter of fact, actually the cold snares do not have a plug. Uh, you can't plug them in into energy. They have a maybe a little round shape, but they, 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 there's no uh, you know uh, current or the plug in where uh, like an area that you can plug in your energy cord. Uh, so that's that's the difference uh, with that. Uh, yeah, that's what I would rec you know answer to your question. Um, in this paper, they they've kind of mentioned that they use endo cut Q mode with effect blur and and cut duration three. Um, now I must confess that I usually ask to have the same settings as whoever the most competent endoscopist is in that institution and I just say I'll use their settings um, but does anyone have a particular view of um, of what is the power required for a you know the best hot snare hey, Dr. Gorgon's the best because I, I, I subscribe to the Vlad Bolshinsky method as well usually for the last 10 years now and it's been working out so <laughs> Dr. Gorgon's a little better at that go ahead Emily. Yeah. I mean, thanks, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I mean the blended cut, you know, like there. That's that's something that we surgeon uh, surgeons don't pay attention to, but I think it's important. Uh, you know, like this, uh, we most of the time see this as blue or yellow petal, but it's very different than that. Really, the, the uh, especially, uh, I mean, the generator is important though. If you're gonna use the surgical generator, it doesn't make make any difference because that's really one is pure cut and then blue uh, yellow is pure cut and blue is uh, pure coagulation basically however if you're going to use advanced endoscopy generators these are like Irby or uh, like Olympus uh, Thunderbeat device those have diff uh, special features that can blend cutting with coagulation so you can really uh, do a cocktail if you will uh, for even the yellow petal on the left side that you can uh, throw in throw in some coagulation. So depending on the patient specifics, if they are on blood, you know, anticoagulation or things like that, or tissue resistance, uh, uh, you can increase the coagulation uh, and and really achieve more more coagulation, less cutting. So so those are important. Like for example, for when we do EST, we do also like pulse cuttings. You know, like it's like buzz, 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 really fast cutting. So you can go slow or fast. If obviously, if you spend too slow, then you, you know, your post polypectomy syndrome type, uh, uh, syndrome, syndrome type of effects will be higher because you're spending more time in one area. So those are really some nuances in, in there that, you know, one has to be aware of. But one comment I want to make for this uh, paper I agree with Dr. Liska. This is a very good paper, and I uh, congratulate Dr. Glandiak and editorial board for accepting this because cold snaring is really accepted by you know ACG and a ACG. You know, like uh, for any polyps that are less than 10 millimeter, and this is well uh, not not well recognized among colorectal surgeons. I think having this type of a paper published in a colorectal journal is very important to increase the awareness. I, I think even just by discussing here and Vlad, congratulations that you picked this up. I think a lot of, of us will be aware of this and this is important. I mean, uh, certainly uh, this is well accepted uh, in worldwide, uh, more in Australian journals, but also in other areas that cold cut is very effective in polyps less than 10 millimeter. I mean, most of us use biopsy forceps, but it's hard to get uh, the lesion, completely remove it. Uh, and and it's, it's not very effective. Uh, and we have seen hot, uh, hot uh, uh, snare has also complications, but uh, definitely the cold, cold cutting is much more effective, plus more cost effective, I think, because you don't use the bovi pad, you don't need to, you know, like uh, have all these potential complications for patients having with, you know, pacemakers and things like that. So certainly from many aspects is, an, is, is advantageous. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Dr. Fleshman, you've got your electronic hand up. Well, um, thank you for recognizing that. And also for um, all of us who do any kind of electric surgery, I think it's key that we remember that 
the fundamentals of use of surgical energy applies not only to open and minimally invasive abdominal surgery, but it applies to endoscopic surgery. And I think if you're going to do anything with a snare, if you will set the setting on the cutting current at the lowest possible setting that's going to damage tissue, you will get the effect you want without risking uh, high voltage and damage to the underlying tissue. And I think we err on the side of always using the maximum amount of energy that we can to make sure there's no bleeding or that we go through it quickly. So you could see where if you set the, and it's an arbitrary setting on any of these energy sources, it doesn't mean anything other than it's somewhere higher than zero. If you set it at a 10 or a 15 setting on your instrument, it's gonna be continuous current and give you the best uh, result uh, if it's set on cutting. If it's on the coagulation or on the blue pedal as, as uh, Emre was talking about, that is an intermittent burst of energy and the energy is not controlled. It goes as high as it needs to to get to that, that area or that power. And if, if, we, if we as energy users insist on taking the fuse course and understanding what we're dealing with, I think we'd be a whole lot better and we would see much less problems. It might eliminate some of the issues with using uh, a hot snare going forward. Thank you. Um, th those are very, very useful points. Um, I'm going to share the results of our poll next, um, which everyone should have on their screen. Um, so certainly we've got quite a range of, um, of um, answers, which, um, which is interesting for trying to get consensus on what to do. Um, but I'm going to ask a few questions, and again, I'll direct it initially to the um, to the panel, and then we'll we'll get some some comments. Um, so, for starters, um, my question is: in terms of affecting an ESD, um, does a cold biopsy, a snare biopsy, or a lift um, all result in equal amount of scar or can we safely use cold biopsies um, before we refer to so an advanced endoscopist and you know is it even worth doing any biopsies given that it probably won't change um, the management pathway sure uh, thank you uh, i think if you are not going to be able to remove a lesion uh, the best thing is I would say not to biopsy it, even if you think it's going to be endoscopically manageable, then just take very good pictures of the, of the lesion and do, uh, do put markings, tattoo distally uh, three quadrants uh, or pro both distally and proximally, at least distally for sure, and just get out, I would say. Uh, I mean, biopsy will certainly will we'll interfere with, with subsequent advanced endoscopic procedures. But if you think it's, it's going to be cancer and most likely going to need surgery, I guess for your future planning, you can do biopsy. But if, you, if you're thinking that this might be amenable for advanced endoscopic intervention, uh, be biopsying that lesion will harm the, uh, the subsequent advanced endoscopic procedures. Thank you. Um, the next thing uh, it actually is a question from Dr. Eisenstadt was, what was the incidence of a sane line lift and is it important? I guess if we go focus on our, you know, 20 millimeter polyp, um, do we always try to lift it? Does it make a difference? And if you try and lift it and it doesn't lift, what do you do then? Uh, so, I mean, from my standpoint, if if I'm going to lift a lesion and it's not lifting, I'm, I'm stopping. Uh, I think we know that the non-lift sign is a, a good indicator that this is an invasive cancer. And that probably shouldn't even be attempted for ESD in, if it doesn't lift. Um, you know, I, I'm blessed, and most of us are, because it's, we'll do some big pops, but anything in our division or department, excuse me, that, 
that looks like it should come out endoscopically, uh, we stop, at least I stop. I know my partners, most of them, we stop and, and, and we take some really good video or pictures for, for Emery. And we're blessed to have him doing what he does. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what other people at other divisions and apartments do without, without the advanced endoscopist person. We had Dr. Church earlier who do a lot of EMRs and some good work and some patients that he would have to do these scopes. And now we have, have Emory. And it's interesting what, what other people do because it's easy to just say, well, that, that fecal polyp just needs to come out with a colectomy. I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but we got that luxury of having Emory there. So it's interesting to see what maybe other people would do in that situation. Dr. Fleshman, down where you're at, I mean, do you have a person on the staff who's just doing uh, advanced endoscopic techniques and trying to save colons from coming out unnecessarily? We rely on our gastroenterology colleagues, um, our advanced endoscopist. I think uh, Dr. Wells and Dr. Stringfield try to do some within our division of colorectal surgery, but most of the time, if there's somebody that I have with a sequel polyp that's too large, but is still benign, um, we'll pass that on to our advanced endoscopist group. And they can usually get it out. It's not a problem. Emery, anything you want to add on, on what yeah, I mentioned? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh, I mean, for non-lifting lifting sign, probably for the board purposes, is probably a red flag. Uh, and probably that's the message uh, the, it should be delivered in the, in, at, the, at the time of the board. But uh, we recently published with Emily Nugent, uh, one of our former uh, fellows from Ireland, uh, uh, the role of ESD in, uh, in scarred lesion uh, published in DCR. So the, the definitely uh, there, might, there might be other reasons that a, a lesion may not be lifting up. Uh, as we earlier mentioned, the, the previous biopsy, biopsying of the lesion or submucosal fibrosis, for example, in IBD patients. Uh, so some uh, lesions that are a little bit more uh, deeper located, uh, maybe like neuroendocrine tumors and things like that. So definitely there is a role, uh, uh, even in those type of patients, especially in high-risk patients, low operative candidates, uh, you can really still inject uh, and, uh, and, and uh, scrape off the muscle layer only by cutting. Obviously these lesions are not amenable for even if they are small for EMR. So you need to be, uh, you need to have a cutting tool in your hands, knife to get underneath that and scrape it off the, off the wall of the colon. But there is, a, in my view, a role for, for those and that's the experience we published recently. Uh Thanks for that. I've got one last question before we before we move on. Um, and my question is about, it's actually related to another study that we featured um, this month uh, about ESDs. Um, this was um, uh, the study is called using endoscopic submucosal dissection as a routine component of standard treatment strategy for large and complex colorectal lesions from um, King's College in London. And so they quote an 8.6 percent risk of perforation in ESD. And what worries me is um, what happens if, if this is an early cancer, so a T1 cancer, and do we, do we or, or maybe even a T2, an early T2, do we manage them as a then a T4? Do we ignore it? Are there any long-term oncological um, results that anyone is aware of? Sure. Uh, we looked at our results here. This is not published, unpublished data, but uh, by Dr. Feinberg, uh, who is in Canada now. She looked at our results for long term in patients that few, thankfully, that perforated and end up having a, a final pathology. These are mostly lower cancers like T1s, uh, not necessarily more advanced tumors, but not like, you know, T4 obviously is very rare. That would be easily recognizable. Uh, and we did look at the oncological outcomes short and long, as long as we can. Uh, that included at least one year long-term outcome and we did not find any differences. But this is the same thing, same data or same concept. Like for example, in transanal minimally invasive surgery, when we do transanal local excisions uh, or TEMIS, and we, when we have perforation and there's no data 
uh, in that field as well that uh, or adverse data showing st these maybe Dr. Fikera can comment on that. I know he has some work on that area or Dr. Fleshman, uh, but, uh, but uh, I mean, it's a similar concept, of course. Some say, you know, you need to you know, clean the uh, abdomen with betadine. I, I totally disagree with that, but I, uh, not to the best of my knowledge, there's no data in that. Just to follow on on that then, when you do an ESD, can you tell if it's on the retroperitoneal side or the intraperitoneal side? And because obviously the analogy of the um, transanal uh, is somewhat, I think, flawed because that's all extra peritoneal. You can occasionally tell. I mean, it depends on which uh, position you do your patients. If you, especially if you are in litatum, for example, and you can uh, fill the colon with fluid. And if that's on the back, for example, likelihood that it is posterior is high. So you can certainly use some, some of these features to predict where, where it is, but you can't really 100% rely on, on that and uh, be aggressive if it's in the retroperitoneal because you, you, you never know, uh, you know, in that segment of colon if, if, if you, the mesentery is completely stuck into the retroperitoneum or not. So it's hard to predict in the colon, different than rectum. Peter Marcello presented his series from Leahy Clinic at the Piedmont Society last month. And he's doing, um, endoscopic resection using the double uh, instrument uh, cap uh, in the endoscope. And what he's found is that if he has a perforation, because he's in the operating room, he can laparoscopic, laparoscopically sew it shut after he's clipped it internally. And he's followed those along enough now that he actually has data that says it doesn't cause anything. Um, David Beck, uh, originally reported doing laparoscopic assisted endoscopic uh, polypectomy where you would just make a big hole and then cut it and, and sew it up and nothing happens. So I think if you're, if you're careful, you're probably okay. I think Alessandro probably has a different idea, but after hearing Peter Marcello talk, I think that's probably the way we're going to go with these polypectomies. Uh, it shouldn't be that, you know, I, at WashU, we had a 90% resection rate of, of large polyps that we referred to our endoscopists. So that cut the number of, of surgical resections way down, and it was safe for the patients. So I think we have to consider those, those things. Uh, as, as opposed to what might happen. If nothing bad is happening, then I think we're all right. Well, thanks for that. Great point. Um, perhaps this is a good time to move on to our next segment. If we can get the, um, the slides back up, please. And so Dr. Gorgon is our special guest for this session. He is, of course, a staff surgeon in the Cleveland Clinic and has been so for the last 10 years. I was fortunate enough to watch Dr. Gorgon operate and learn from him. And I have tried to adopt a number of his techniques, be it in a more cat-handed manner. Um, and certainly his, his technique and his movements are, are exceptional in that he really doesn't waste any movement in surgery. And it is beyond my understanding why he would forego traction, counter-traction, and triangulation, and get interested in this endoluminal business. So perhaps we'll spend the next um, few minutes asking him uh, what, what inspired him to get into advanced endoscopy, uh, particularly uh, having been a skilled and highly successful MIS uh, colorectal surgeon. Thank you, Vlad. This very kind introduction and kind uh, words of you. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I think the fact that it's uh, mind blowing in the United States and globally that uh, the amount of lesions we get as surgeons uh, are referred to us for colon resections and organ resections. It's, it, it's really scary and unsafe to, and, and we just take it granted and just remove these large organs. Uh, and these patients suffer from a lot of complications, 
a hospital stay and it's a burden for our healthcare system as well. So I, I, think, I think recognizing that made me think about, we gotta do something better uh, for these. Sometimes we do take these colons out for and gastroenterologists, nothing negative, but you know, just because they refer to us and, and not amenable for uh, endoscopic removal, just by that word, we take someone's organ out and then we, and I end up and opening these specimens up and there's a tiny polyp sometimes, you know, that's really an over-treatment and uh, we're not doing any favor to our patients. Recognizing that made me think we need to do something better. Uh, I, obviously I need to give credit to also where I was trained, you know, that I, my thinking was influenced by Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Milsom as well as Dr. Sang Lee and others uh, and Peter Marcelo, uh, so that we need to do better techniques. And that's how uh, we started to do that. But, you know, times have changed. We, uh, we did do, we still uh, do with the endos advanced endoscopy or ESD or endoscopic some causal dissection um, some, to some degree traction or counter traction by you applying the cap at the end of the scope. So if you really work close to the lesion, you, you, and get into that space, you can still create that uh, retraction and contra-traction. But uh, times have changed now that to the point that we now exploring the options of endoluminal surgery with using some enabling technologies, bringing you know, over the tube or some new platforms into the lumen, lumen inside of the intestine and, and from tiny channels, Dr. Fleshman just mentioned, you know, double channel scope, for example, but one step beyond that, you know, bringing an over tube or additional uh, accessory channels along the scope and maybe bringing instruments, uh, external instruments and grabbing the tissue and retracting it. Uh, so we, there's more to be accomplished in that area and, and better times are coming. Okay, that, that, that's um, very optimistic. And it leads me to ask, what, um, what is the service that you've developed at Cleveland Clinic? How does that work? Uh, with the help of Dr. Steele uh, and, uh, and uh, our uh, institute uh, leadership, we, dev we developed uh, a services like Endoluminal Surgery Center at the moment. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a huge uh, I, uh, service that we provide to our patients to the region uh, nas nationally and internationally that, uh, that we also collaborated with our uh, gastroenterology colleagues and, uh, and we provide these services to them in terms of uh, streamlining our appointments, services, surgeries. So all, uh, and we develop care pads, they bring we have a system when patients contact us that we bring, bring those uh, images in colored images, look at them, review them, uh, and pathologies are also sent with these requests. And then just we uh, triage them, whether we, this is something that is maybe a little bit easier that can go to an outpatient setting, or this is a little bit more complex lesion that needs to be in the operating room that was Dr. Fleshman just mentioning, if we can do combined endolaparoscopic surgery or cells, because we, there's a huge or higher chance that we might do, uh, do perforation and may need laparoscopic assistance, or even if, if we think that we might proceed to bowel resection. So we, we have all these different potential options that we can offer to our patients, but it's a spectrum of patients that come to us that some may not to be in the operating room because that's a, a, a big over undertake, you know, for our time, surgeons times secondarily, but more importantly for patients to put them into the operating room, a lot of tests, a lot of time commitments, especially if they're coming out of the state. So, so we really streamline these services uh, in terms of outreach and marketing. Of course, that's helping a lot. And we have a really very high, high case volume at the moment that uh, I, I can say we are privileged to serve our patients uh, these services. And they come from many different uh, states. And like I mentioned, globally as well. And they, we, we keep their columns and save the colon is our, our, uh, our theme here. Like okay. Dr. Valente mentioned. 
Um, now you've um, uh, going on to the next question then, what training and skills did you have when you started and what training is required to start adopting ESD? So I started about 10 years ago and it wasn't easy for me at the time. Really, I was passionate about this, recognizing the challenges with these patient, you know, colectomies for small polyps and, and so forth. But there were not many resources available to, to me at the time. And uh, I had to travel to Japan, you know, do case observations. Obviously, you can't do hands-on experience then. And I, uh, and I just kind of bit the bullet here and started to do my own cases. But as a surgeon, I think we have a unique opportunity that we can do these procedures in the operating room. And even, even you know, we, these are patients, remember, sent for bowel resection anyway. Let me put the scope in and remember always using the CO2. Uh, if you're gonna end up doing laparoscopy, you don't wanna blow up your colon too, too large to prevent your or make your bowel surgery very difficult. So, and that's how we started. And first case uh, was an older gentleman uh, on the right side. And it took me pretty long to get that uh, lesion out, but I recorded it. And uh, and, and, on the, and and there was a pneumatosis on the wall a little bit, and I ended up keeping this patient, I remember, six, six days in the hospital, uh, but then successfully went home, and his polyp was benign, and I, I submitted that to Askars as a video, and uh, I got a lot of criticism uh, on the podium, I remember, but then after I got called multiple times to different venues to speak about this, and, and then I started to see more patients, so that that was part of the pathway and Dr. Steele uh, was very supportive of these services. Then after we went, I went to Japan, did see more about, e I'm sorry, to Australia, uh, where you are from, uh, uh, Vlad, you know, like in Sydney, Dr. Uh, Michael Burke is a great uh, advanced endoscopist and he has a lot of uh, publications on that uh, in uh, uh, Westmead Hospital. And, and and learned a lot and you know and applied these uh, applications but for new learners now we have a lot of uh, venues options courses ASCARS, uh, as well as ACS uh, and also individual courses in different institutions we provide our our advanced endoscopy courses so there's a lot uh, a lot of opportunities to learn these techniques thank you um now um what was my next question yeah um so learning a new skill is becoming easier when the skills are more prevalent how many esds would you need to maintain competence do you think esd is uh, i mean i'll be honest with you it's a very technically demanding procedure really hard. it's hard to acquire the skills to 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 proficiently man uh, perform it. So uh, according to Japanese papers uh, and our, our, our studies here, we looked at certainly the number is uh, uh, not below 50, even some, some publications say up, up to 100, and I do agree with that. But another uh, aspect is it's just not the ESD technique, but before you even start doing ESD, you need to be very, very, very proficient in your endoscopic skills and your sco scoping skills. And there's minimum requirement for that as well, actually. Most uh, authors or most experts say you need to have at least 250 or 300, or even according to Jap Japanese authors, even four or 500 scopes a year before you can even consider performing ESD, because you should be able to do really good scopes before you can do these advanced endoscopies. But so 50 to 100 cases, I would say, comfortably to be able to uh, pro proficiently perform ESD. So, so in, in future then, do you see this being a colorectal run skill or will it kind of sort of branch out, say, like cardiothoracics and, and interventional cardiology, where ultimately um, the endoluminal things have been taken up by the interventional cardiologists as opposed to the surgeons? 
rather than cardiologists, I looked, I like to look at that more like vascular surgery, you know, like uh, endovascular surgery is done by vascular surgeon and it's taken by them. And I think we, we got to think about that like that. Uh, uh, it's interventional, not interventional cardiologists, interventional uh, colorectal surgeons, I think will take it because like vascular surgeons, we are familiar with outside of the vessels, we are familiar with the outside of the intestine and inside as well. And I think we are in a unique position that we, we know the thickness of the wall, we know the uh, you know curvature, we know when we can perforate a colon better. And we also know and comfortable if we do perforate, how, we fi how to fix it. And even if it's in the middle of the night or late, late on a Friday night, that's our fault or, or that's our doing and we will fix it ourselves and we would better fix it, uh, I think. And, and also we can be more uh, invasive or aggressive, if you will, uh, be, because if, especially if you can apply these techniques in the operating room and if you, if you perforate, you can immediately assist uh, with uh, laparoscopy and repair that. In addition to that, though, I have to add, we, I mentioned earlier the endoluminal surgery. So I think that's where we are heading. I mean, you mentioned earlier that too optimistic, but it is not. We, we are actually working with uh, different uh, uh, product develop, de developers to, uh, to bring these platforms into the field. We, uh, for example, there's a double, double balloon system that uh, uh, we performed here at, at the Cleveland Clinic. First 30 cases to date uh, with this uh, retraction method and and uh, and we can bring these graspers even into the right colon. F more than 50% of our patients with endoluminal platforms that we applied these 30 cases is uh, proximal to the splenic flexure. So we can uh, enable or we can make an endoluminal surgery a, a reality. It's going to take a, a while time to uh, re you know make it perfect, but. Uh, I, I think it's a, 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 we're gonna get there with technology advancements. Yeah, I I know that you uh, actively participate in a course uh, for the fellows uh, about um, the ESD course, which which I attended, and one of the trainees there for me was Carl Cologne, who I think is on the on the call as well. So that was a fantastic opportunity, and I highly recommend that for all the fellows. Um, now. Um, in terms of the future, the other thing I want to know is we're getting better techniques at removing things, but are we getting better techniques as prognosticating um, stage? Do you think that the rate limiting step in endoluminal surgery is that we're still, you know, we're still limited by an MRI in the pelvis and a CT scan in the abdomen in terms of the choice of operation sometimes? Yeah, I mean, if we obviously we we're not gonna fix everything with endoluminal surgery. Endoluminal surgery for early pre-malignant or uh, early malignant lesions are ideal, but for when it comes to malignancies, having said that, early malignant and uh, you know, like in the United States, in a given year for pre-malignant lesions, uh, there are thirty thousand colon resections performed. Thirty thousand. So there's a lot large number of volume for endoluminal surgery, even with the current state. Having said that, if you wanna expand that for more advanced colorectal cancer, obviously that's gonna uh, probably take a long time, but uh, if the markers, like you stated, like properly stating, is staging it, or for example, sentinel node never really got to a point, but if you would have some sort of uh, biological marker or circulating DNA where we could identify the uh, presence of lymph nodes, then if you are 99% specific, oh, it's, you know, this is T2, T3 with no lymph node involvement, then I would say game over, then you can even remove those lesions and even close the defect and you don't have to worry about uh, lymph node uh, harvesting. But of course, I think we are uh, way away from, from, from those day, days. Well, that is a, a wonderfully optimistic point to end. Um, and I, I think we're, we're, we're out of time. Thank you very much uh, for everyone for attending and, and giving up your time, particularly the host institution and, and the people that spoke. Um,
I, I think um, I found at least uh, this very informative and very interesting. So um, for people that um, might want to recommend it to others, certainly it's recorded on the YouTube channel. So please um, have a look at the DCR YouTube channel. Um, next month, um, we will uh, be in, in Dallas. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And, um, and it, it is uh, fantastic actually seeing a lot of the uh, faculty for from next month attending attending this month. So, thank you all for um, for this journal club. Thank you, Vlad. thank you for having me, Vlad. Thank you.